This is the Evergreen Empire. Green grow the forests and fair flow the streams. The gentle deer grazes, the wild blossom gleams. From ocean wave raging to mountain serene. All nature's proclaiming our lands evergreen. Welcome to Columbia Conversations. I'm Felix Bunnell, editor of Columbia Magazine for the Washington State Historical Society. On this episode, excerpts from a conversation with Michael Finley and Shelley Boyd of the Colville Tribe. Shelley Boyd's essay, Save the Language and the Language Will Save You, is the cover story for the autumn 2021 issue of Columbia. In our conversation from earlier this summer, we touched on many chapters of Northwest history, including residential schools. I think a lot of Americans now look at Canada and say, wow, look at the problem they have. It, it's not, it's a problem of this continent, and I think it's a problem globally. Michael Finley is a tribal historian, former tribal chair, and tribal liaison for the Washington State Historical Society. Shelley Boyd is a language scholar and co-founder of the Inchilium Language House. We spoke by phone and began with Michael Finley and the discovery earlier this year of unmarked graves at a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. It's been all over the press, and you're seeing a lot of what um, is being said. Um, but a lot of it's indicative of, of what we've always known as Native people, what we've been told. Uh, it's a very traumatizing era in our history that isn't well known to the general public but it should be, but it's only finds like this where people finally start to pay attention to what we've always been saying. And so our our voices have been muted by a lot of different um, efforts, but this is a very systematic, a very deliberate attempt to wipe us off the map. But it takes findings like this that when people finally pay attention to what we've been saying about what's going on. When Mike talks about a systematic, you know, effort, I don't think that that effort has, has necessarily stopped. It's, it's just turned to a denial of, of truth. And so in, in many aspects, you know, these children are still, they're still doing, you know, their work as indigenous people to uncover truth. Yeah, and, and to that point and to that end, and I want to be very clear about this because it's it's very much deeply ingrained in the 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 historical trauma that I have received as a neighbor person to this day. So my dad um, isn't widely even widely known in our community. He went to Pasco Sherman Indian School, and it, it, it's it's a it, it's boarding school. It was established for that reason, and. He was a part of the historic uh, lawsuit that happened a number of years ago uh, for sexual abuse. And he, for the first time in his life, um, a little over 10 years ago, shared this with his, you know, his kids. You know, he was sexually abused there. And he, he, you know, he got a settlement for that, but it went beyond that. And he, he, he told me about some of the kids that were abused there that were uh, physically abused about a kid that was shot and the priest didn't think it was a big deal, threw him in the car, went inside, did what he was going to do for over an hour. So there's all these stories. And I, I, I've interviewed my, my grandpa and my, 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 my great aunt, who is the only one left of the 18 Finley children that were part of our big family. And she talked about our um, her older sister that one that got sent off to Carlisle when she was younger, and they didn't hear for weeks that she had died. And the the only answer they got when they said that she died way over at Carlisle was that oh she took a shower, she put her head out the window to talk to somebody from her dorm room, and it was midwinter and she caught pneumonia and died. And there was no more answer than that. And, but she talked about the pain of that and how the family didn't know for weeks that their, her older sister had died. And, you know, my great aunt is the only one that's left out of those 18 siblings, but she's alive today to tell that story. 
And so it's, there's many stories like this that are painful and they, they run through our generations today through their historical uh, trauma that a lot of people don't want to recognize or talk about, but it's very real. And um, I guarantee you, if it happened in any other scenario, it'd be headlines everywhere. But for some reason, because it happened to native people, nobody wants to give it the same level of credence that they would otherwise. And I hate to say it that way, but it's true. And we're the survivors of that historic trauma, but we're here to tell the story and we're not going anywhere. I'm really, I'm, I'm so sorry for what your families have gone through. That's just, it's, there's, there's no, there's absolutely no, there's no rhyme or reason for it at all. Um, what was the name of the school your dad was at? Haskell Sherman Indian School. It's uh, near OMAC. And my dad and a lot of his siblings were there. And a lot of that's tied to, like, my grandparents were tied up in alcoholism, but that's all tied to, like, uh, uh, you know, the Grand Coulee Dam going in, that taking away our traditional way of life, which was Kettle Falls, our, our historic fishery. So our way of life that we knew for thousands of years was suddenly removed from us without our w- w- without our consent. And then we were told just to make it happen. And so, you know, our, our my, my grandparents were were victims of of, you know, progress, manifest destiny, you know, and you know, they turned to the bottle and, you know, our kid, uh, their kids were sent to this boarding school, which were my parents, um, my, my, my dad and all of his siblings. And that's just my dad's story. And he, 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 if my Auntie Debbie was alive or Jackie or any of them were alive, they could tell you their story. So but my dad has so many other stories he told me about what happened over there that he just doesn't want to talk about it. It's, hurt, it's hurtful for him to talk about it. It's hurtful for a grown man to talk about how he was sexually abused and admit it. But, you know, when you look at some of the things we deal with as Native people today, a lot of the problems that we have are, are, are all tied to this, this past that was inflicted on us, and then we're expected to be these normal functioning people today. And so the fact that we do the things we do today on a very high level is 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 testament to our strength as Native people to, to continue on. And we do it. And here's a question. I mean, you know, if you study the 19th century history about the treaties and the reservations, wasn't that all just, I mean, wasn't the goal just genocide? Wasn't the goal just to wipe out the natives? Wasn't the, the reservations and the treaties just kind of a way of sort of glossing over the fact that most people wanted the native population just gone and didn't really care? Yeah, yeah. And so you, you hear a lot about what happened in um, World War II, the genocide of the Jews. Like, you know, that's well documented, and it, as it should be. But when you talk about the Geneva Convention and all these other things, Canada, you know, United States, um, talking about, oh, we got to do this for what we did to the Japanese during World War II. We got to do this, we got to do that. They never take ownership of what, what they did to their own native population. And they, and they're time and time again, and you, you, if you read the history, the, the real history, you'll see that they've taken tremendous effort to try to cover it up and not talk about it. They assign different religions to different reservations for the sole purpose of converting us. We were removed from our homes, sent to a place we didn't know, couldn't speak our language. The, Kill the Indian, save the man was one of the biggest slogans I've heard, you know, as a historian growing up and doing my own research. That was that, that they lived and died, died by that, that. That was their their mantra in the United States government systematically did that and he did it very deliberately and not enough people are talking about it they're only talking about it today is because they're finding the remains of our people that are in the ground and there's that like i said it's just it's just the tip of the iceberg there's so much more out there to be said and heard and i was just going to add to that you know um as the sinai coordinator for the the colville tribe you know we have been fighting a legal battle about a, you know the declaration of our extinction in Canada, which you know if if you were to ask me as as an individual person, I would say it all leads back to 
the resources of the Upper Columbia Basin and, and that tie to the Columbia River Treaty and and also mining and 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 settlement and and farmland. I mean, there was a purpose to everything and including declaring us extinct. We're the only people of Canada that actually hold a declaration of extinction that we've found in any records. And we've looked extensively. Uh, but, but the point being is that I don't know how many people have said to me, but you don't actually have a declaration of extinction, do you? You don't, it's not, it's more like, you know, they wanted you gone. It's like, no, there was an actual declaration that, that, that declared us gone. And it was it was to serve purpose at that time. You know, I'm not saying the Columbia River Treaty was the reason that we were pushed south. It, it is that was the marker kind of on on saying, oh well, they don't exist, so we're okay do, making any kind of agreements in within this territory with the, the United States. And leading that on to, and I want to say, Leemlim, thank you, Felix, for for this interview, just because. I think a lot of Americans now look at Canada and say, wow, look at the problem they have. It, it's not, it's a problem of this continent. And I think it's a problem globally that it, it really speaks to colonization. And that's the piece that we are not paying attention to at a high enough level, you know, that, 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 that th these things continue to happen now. And, and if we don't, if we don't acknowledge them, we're never going to change them. And if we don't change them, we're going to suffer the results of of the pain that is left behind after the, this kind of of um, I'm going to just say genocide is placed upon people. Yeah. Still happening. Yeah. No, I think that's that's accurate language. And there's just there's been this reluctance or this. Um, I mean, wasn't the Colville Reservation the one they cut in half when they found mineral resources they, that white people wanted, like a hundred years ago? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's sort of there's just consistent policies like that. So, so it, it started before that. So the first reservation they set aside isn't even it, you know where we're at located now. It was actually on the the east side of the river. You know, it was there, but then there was this huge uproar of of settlers that already kind of settled in the Colville Valley. They pushed out my my family, my Seymour family, and I know that because my great aunt, who's no longer here told me the whole story how they got pushed out of there and the deliberate attempt to push them out of there. So fast forward to when they actually established the reservation there, they had a huge uproar. And so that reservation lasted three or four months and they said, oh, we're going to throw the Indians on the other side of the river. So they did that and they gave us the, the, the huge landscape they gave us. And they're like, oh, well, we found these, we found these minerals on the north half. So we're going to negotiate with you on what that will be. And it ended up being about a dollar an acre. And then even like when they say they had enough signatures to sign, which I I I I call foul because I looked at the agreement at the National Archives. I held it in my hands, and you know they were supposed to go you know uh, go across all these extreme temperatures and you know landscapes to get from one side to the other to get the needed quote unquote needed needed signatures. And that that document is crisp. It's so like like it didn't see. The light of day, the light, of light of day ever, but there's all these X's that are on there, and I know as a historian, as a person from our community, I looked at some of the people that were signed on there, quote unquote, X's are all the same. Some of those people knew how to sign their own name at the time, and yet they're all just X's, and they're perfect X's, like the same person wrote it. And so, what I'm getting at is, is like, you know, there's always this effort, but you know, we always have to follow somebody else's rules and when we try to follow them we still get screwed and then you have this sideline effort of trying to remove our culture and identity from our people and within the community and you know that that is genocide i don't care what anybody says that systematic genocide and a very deliberate a very well thought out effort and what you're what you're seeing with you know all these remains being turned up and all that it's it's stuff that we've all Shelly and I have heard our whole life from from our pe from our people from our family about how they were treated and what happened and I, I'm I'm also I'm, I'm also thankful that you're doing this today um, and that you know it's, there's going to be an audience behind what we're doing right now but we need more people to to acknowledge and pay attention to this because we can only heal only if we have acknowledgement 
and we have a very honest attempt to try to fix the wrongs that were done in a meaningful way. And I just, I just hope that, that we can get there. You know, and there are certain um, pockets of people and communities across the nation, both uh, north and south of the border that I think want to do that or are trying to do that, but there's got to be a bigger effort from the federal government and especially within the religions they assign to different reservations to acknowledge that. Because if anybody else did that, you see them racing down Nazi people to this day, like people there in their 90s. Oh, we're still trying to bring them to justice. There's this guy that was part of the SSS that did this. He's living down somewhere in South America. They're racing all, all those people down to this day. Why aren't they racing down the people and some of these priests that did this to our people and bringing them to justice. You don't see that. So we're not getting the same treatment. And help me understand the difference, if there is a difference, between the residential school system in Canada and how it was run by a specific, um, like the Catholic Church in a lot of cases, I guess, and then the system here in the U.S. Let, let's start with the system in Canada. I mean, what, what, tell, what did, that, did that policy come from on high to, to treat the the, for this inhumane treatment and 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 death and and abuse or was is that sort of was it coordinated or is it, I mean where does that come from? Yeah, it was coordinated. It was definitely coordinated. There's a lot of documents out there that that show it, and there's books out there, there's literature out there that say it, but people don't want to listen to it because it's America. Like, oh, we would never do that. No, you did that. Right, and 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 so when you ask Felix, and that's such a great question, you know. What's the difference between Canada and the United States and, and residential schools? I don't think there is one. I don't, you know, and Mike, you could speak more to that, I think, but, but I, I don't think that the stories are the same. When we, when we talk to our communities and our relatives in Canada, the stories are the same. And we like to kind of make a line in the ground and say, oh, well, that was Canada, that, and this is the United States. Of course, we would never do that. And I think the heart of, of all of this is really like following the truth. And my late husband would say it the best. He would be like, no matter how difficult the path forward is, the easiest way through is to follow the truth. And that's what we can give all of our children. And that's how we, we don't repeat these kinds of her horrific mistakes. And we don't stand around as a country and watch them be repeated. And and uh, in, in terms of a, like a, the reconciliation part, the truth and reconciliation part, I mean, thinking about it from sort of a, I don't know if this is a Western thought or a European school of thought or whatever, it seems like, I mean, is, 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 is one particular, one possible step, almost like a establishing a list of who's, of who is missing, like try to actually, try to actually quantify the kids who disappeared quantify like get those records like they're trying to do in Canada like trying to like they I know some of the Catholic orders have finally are ag agreeing to release some of the records they've been holding for um, decades is there is there some sort of a um a commission required to kind of gather all this data whatever data might be available whether it's through interviews or through records that might be at the National Archives or at these different schools that might you know it might not exist anymore but where the records ended up someplace is it would it be wise at either a federal level or a state level to sort of try to compile this data to really quantify what we're talking about here? Or is that kind of, is that, am I missing the point? No, I, I think you're exactly on the point and, and that's part of the truth. You can't have the reconciliation if we won't go to the truth and we can't have the truth unless we follow it. That's a hard path. That's a painful path. And some people might say, well, why do that? It's gone. It's done. It's over with. Just move on. Because we're told that all the time as a community and stuff. But to understand where do these social issues that we have come from? Where does this pain come from? What is generational trauma? Like, how do we get to the bottom of that if we won't get to the bottom of the truth and just say, oh, yeah. I mean, we can. I, I was introduced to something um, uh, a term in this past year called colonial gaze, where it's it's this this uh, view of of kind of taking um, indigenous matters and just kind of blazing over them, and not really looking at them, but then saying, "Hey, yeah, I, I looked at that. No, I don't think that is it, it, looking at that. 
and looking at that with your eyes and with your mind and with your heart are completely different things. And, and that's something that, that I absolutely agree. And not only does that commission need to happen, but, but in our culture, those children want to come home. They still want to come home and they should be sent home. They should finally get to come home. Yeah. And then, um, you know, to the end that you're, you're, you were you were alluding to, uh, Felix, that, you know, we need to have, you know, you know, maybe a better understanding of that. But, you know, part of our ability to trace back our lineage, lineage is like very um, difficult to do because of how we were dealt with and documented as Native people throughout history. And so... Um, for example, you know, we all had our traditional names that are in our language. Um, there's another a case where the, the federal government from the highest level said to all the Indian agents, well, if you're going to document these people, don't document them as their, their native name anymore. We don't want to deal with that. So you get the closest translation or the best corruption of what their name says and put it in English. I know that because I was at the National Archives and I found that document that told everybody to do this, right? And so that's why you get, with some reservations, you get the translation of what their name was. You know, like it could be Running Bull. Well, you know, that's not what we called ourselves 300 years ago. That's the English corruption uh, translation of what it was. And they couldn't figure it out. There's one case here at Calvo. One guy, his name was, any name was Kilcalu. Um, they're like, well, we can't pronounce that. Uh, uh, we don't like the translation, so we're going to call you Billy Curley. And that's what, that's what his name was. And so throughout time, as that happens, and through all the trauma that's happened, you know, some of that falls through the cracks. And so we've been literally like beat over a rug and all, everything's shaken out and we're told this is your, your, your new identity and somewhere along the line we're expected today to try to trace out the best we can and it was never more apparent than when we had to go through this Arrow Lakes case in Canada that we're talking about the residential school that's, that's near our traditional territory. You know we had to hide the best genealogist that is alive today to help us better understand this but even for her, trying to do it across boundaries was very difficult for her. She had a very good, deep understanding of what it was prior to us being pushed out of Canada, but it took our knowledge from our side to help connect the dots. But we had to do that. We had to prove that we are who we say we are to a government that established these rules that weren't ours. But we did it, and we won. Okay, well, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me so thoughtfully about this, because it's you know, I, I do think there's great opportunity for education for, and, and, and sort of telling the stories again and again and again because people have short attention spans. You know, here people are busy with their phones and they're driving their cars and they've got, you know, they're thinking about their kids or whatever. But it's like once and for all, I mean, this sort of has this, this reckoning is coming and, and reconciliation, I think, is possible. But it's just going to take a lot of effort by a lot of people. And I'd hope it doesn't take some George Floyd moment because... God, it's just that's the last thing we need here is, is more more violence, more new violence to, you know, to try to somehow compensate for violence in the past. It never seems like a good idea, but it seems so inevitable sometimes. So I don't know. I, I'm hopeful, though, I guess. Are you are you guys hopeful about the future? That Maybe that's me a good last question. Well, I, I, I'm hopeful. And, uh, you know, it's it's funny. Shelly and I just kind of had this conversation a few hours ago uh, was that. I told her, it was like, her and I are both first generation. Like, we, you know, the the deck wasn't stacked in our favor. You know, we were, we started from the, the start line, you know, 100 yards behind everybody else. You know, for all the reasons that I talked about a little bit ago. There's the trauma, all those things. And, you know, there's eight of us that grew up in the three-bedroom trailer growing up. You know, it was mouse-infested. We had skunks coming through the floor. That's how bad it was. Um, but, you know, all of us in my family, my parents' kids, all of us but our youngest sibling all went and got advanced degrees, you know. And we were one of the poorest families in my community. And our community didn't have a, you know, the richest person wasn't that rich, you know. And But we're doing it because we care. And 
we're doing it because we we, 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 we felt this trauma growing up and we, we want better for our kids. And so as parents, we're trying to prepare our kids to be our next future leaders. But for me, I want to be to where they go and do bigger and better things than I ever thought I could do. And so I'm trying to set them on that path. I'm trying to create a new norm outside of trauma for my family and my kids and my kids' kids and their kids' kids to follow a path that's a lot better than what was, the, 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 you know, where I started. And so, yeah, for me, there's hope. And that's my hope. And I'm, on my, I'm, I'm fully dedicated to doing that right now for my kids and my family. I agree. I think that I am hopeful also. And, and for many of the things that Mike just spoke about, and I think that one of the advantages that we have as indigenous people, of people of color, is that um, as, as regardless of the hardships that have happened to us generationally, we are in different spots. No matter how hard the spot is that we are in right now, it's better and easier than the spots that 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 the hardest hit generations of, of whom we come from. And I think that, that we do our best to educate our children with a lot of truth, regardless of what that is. And, and I know that expanding that view, uh, I think of my granddaughter, Jamila, who two years ago, you know, she did a, a service corps in uh, Thailand, you know, digging water holes for elephants because everything matters, everything matters. And if we don't pay attention to the truth, then, then we're lost. But if we do, even if it's painful, if we do, then we're, we've got some traction to go somewhere differently. And I feel like that, that one of the great things that George Floyd and everything that, that has happened within the, the black community is really spotlighting the the opportunity that we have to follow more of the truth. And, and then we can, we can do things better for everyone and we can be better globally, not just locally, but especially locally, we can be better. Thank you to Michael Finley and Shelley Boyd for speaking with me for this episode of Columbia Conversations from the Washington State Historical Society. Shelley Boyd's essay, Save the Language and the Language Will Save You, is the cover story for the autumn 2021 issue of Columbia. For more information about Columbia Magazine or to subscribe, please visit WashingtonHistory.org. I'm Felix Bunnell.